Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 36. In this lecture, we'll discuss the buoyant force. This topic is covered in Chapter 14 of our textbook by Survey and Jouette. In this lecture, I want to tell you about the buoyant force. But before doing so, let me introduce you to the concept of buoyancy. Buoyancy is the tendency of an object to float in a fluid. And when I say fluid, I mean either a gas or a liquid. So we might be talking about, for example, a ship floating in water, but we could also be talking about a hot air balloon floating in air. In both of those cases, the tendency of the object, the ship or the hot air balloon to float is referred to as buoyancy. Ultimately, buoyancy is due to the buoyant force. So here's a new force that you need to learn about. You could add it to the collection of forces that you already know about. For example, you should already know about the normal force, weight, friction, uh, tension, and the spring force. And if you've already taken a course on electricity and magnetism, you might know about the electric force or the magnetic force. Well, here's a new force for you to learn about. We'll denote the buoyant force using the letter B, and it turns out that the buoyant force is equal to rho, that's density, times G, that's gravitational acceleration, times V, and that's volume. Now, some of these quantities require a little more explanation. In particular, rho is the density of the fluid, not the object. So you might be given a problem where, for example, a block of wood is floating in a tank of water. In that case, um, the density that gets plugged in here should be the density of water, not the density of wood. Also, V here is not necessarily the entire volume of the object. V here, more precisely, is the displaced volume, which is also known as the submerged volume. Specifically, it's the volume of the object that is underwater, so to speak, the volume that is submerged. It's referred to as the displaced volume because it's the volume of the fluid that had to be displaced or moved out of the way to make room for the object. In the example here, the displaced volume refers specifically to this volume here. This volume used to be filled with water or fluid before the object was placed in there, but once the object was placed in there and allowed to float, that volume of fluid had to be displaced, and that's precisely the volume that needs to be uh, substituted into this equation. Now, this equation is sometimes known as Archimedes' principle in honor of the Greek mathematician and engineer who first described the concept of buoyancy. Now, Archimedes probably did not describe buoyancy in this form. This equation here is a sophisticated and modern description of buoyancy. Archimedes probably said something closer to this statement. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. So starting from this equation, we can basically derive Archimedes' principle as follows. So we know that buoyancy is equal to rho gv. We also know that rho times v is equal to mass. A little more generally, we often define density as mass divided by volume. By uh, rearranging this equation, we can see that rho times v should give us the mass. Now, we are talking about the density of the fluid and the volume of the fluid that is displaced. So really what we should um, have here is the mass of the displaced fluid. So the subscript DF here is just referring to the displaced fluid. You should also know that mass times gravitational acceleration is simply weight. Of course, if we're talking about mass of the displaced fluid, then we should be talking about the weight of the displaced fluid. So this is a useful concept. However, for most of our calculations, we'll be using this modern form of the buoyancy equation.
On the previous slide, I introduced you to buoyancy and gave you the formula for the buoyant force, but I didn't derive that formula. It turns out you can derive that formula using concepts that we've already learned, like pressure, and in particular, the variation of pressure with depth. So on this slide, I want to go through that derivation somewhat carefully. The first thing we need to discuss is the fact that a fluid consists of a large number of particles. So if we're talking about a block of wood, for example, floating in a tank of water, you need to imagine that there is a large number of fluid particles, so H2O molecules, and that these molecules are moving around relatively rapidly. These molecules will uh, occasionally collide with each other, Sometimes they will collide with the walls of the container, and now that there is an object placed inside the fluid, these fluid particles will occasionally uh, collide with the object. As they collide with the object, they exert forces on the areas with which they are colliding. So to be a little more precise, imagine you have a cubical block of wood placed inside a tank of water. The H2O molecules near the top face of the cube will collide with that face, and as they do so, they will exert a downward force, which we'll call F1. At the same time, molecules near the bottom of the object will collide with the bottom face of the cube and exert a certain force on that face. That force will be upwards, and we'll call it F2. Similarly, molecules on the left side and on the right side will be colliding with those faces of the cube, exerting forces F3 and F4. Now, we are talking about a three-dimensional object here, so to be complete, you also need to consider the molecules behind the object and in front of the object, and so there are additional forces, F5 and F6, that are also acting on the object. For now, we'll ignore those forces. It turns out to derive the result that we want. It's sufficient to consider these four forces here. Now, these four forces are not all equal to each other. It turns out the force that the fluid exerts on the object depends on the pressure of the fluid. At this point, it helps to recall two important expressions that we've talked about before. First, pressure is equal to force divided by area. And second, pressure varies with depth according to this equation here. Rearranging the first equation, we find that force can be expressed as pressure times area. And since pressure varies with depth, we can now substitute the second equation and find that the force is equal to P sub zero plus D rho G times A. Recall that P sub zero was simply the surface pressure, so the pressure at the top point of the fluid. This formula tells us that the forces that are being exerted on this cube are not equal to each other. After all, the bottom face of the cube is at a greater depth compared to the top face, so we expect that the pressure near the bottom is greater and therefore the force near the bottom is greater. We can make all of that a little more precise as follows. We can say that the force on face one, that's the top face of the cube, is simply equal to the pressure there times the area of that face. Since that force points in the negative y direction, we're going to write the force vector as minus P1A J hat. So we're adopting a standard xy coordinate system, and we're basically saying that this force is pointing in the negative j hat or negative y direction. Now the pressure uh, at face one is related to the depth of face one. So if we say that the depth of the top face of the cube is d1, then we can say that p1 is equal to the surface pressure plus the depth at that face times the density of fluid times gravitational acceleration. Similarly, the force that's exerted on phase two is the pressure at phase two times the area of the face. We are talking about a cube here, so we're going to assume that all six faces of the cube have the same area. 
And then we can say that the pressure at phase two is again equal to the surface pressure plus the depth of phase two times rho times g. Now calculating F3 and F4 is a little more difficult because those faces don't have a constant depth. The depth changes at different points on those faces. So to figure out F3 and F4, we'd really have to perform integration along that face. However, for now, we're just going to say that F3 and F4 must be equal and opposite. So I'm not telling you exactly what F3 is. What I'm saying is whatever F3 is, F4 is going to be exactly the same, but in the opposite direction. So I'll just say that F3 is equal to minus F4. Now we're interested in the buoyant force. It turns out what we call the buoyant force is just this force. More precisely, it's the sum of these four forces. So the net force exerted by all the fluid that surrounds the object is referred to as the buoyant force. So to calculate the buoyant force, we're going to add F1, F2, F3, and F4. To be complete, you can also add F5 and F6 to this expression here. However, F5 and F6 will be equal and opposite, so they will add up to zero, just as F3 and F4 will add up to zero. So the important forces are really just F1 and F2. So we can take our expressions for F1 and F2 near the top, plug them in here, and we'll see that there are some cancellations. So for example, this P0 will cancel out this P0. We can factor out the rho, the g, and the a. That gives us the rho g a here. And what we're left with is d2 minus d1. Now recall that d2 is the depth of the bottom face and d1 is the depth of the top face. So when I talk about d2 minus d1, I'm really simply talking about the height of the object. If you take the height of the object and multiply it by the area of one face, what you get is the volume of the object. So finally, what we have found is that the buoyant force is equal to the density of the fluid times gravitational acceleration times the volume of the object. Now here I'm assuming that the entire object is submerged, so the V that we have here is in fact the total volume of the object, but if the object is only, let's say, 50% underwater, then this V would have to be 50% of the total volume. So more precisely, this is the displaced volume. So now that we have a better understanding of buoyancy and its formula, let's talk about some of its applications. It turns out probably the most important application of the buoyant force formula is in answering a very simple question. Will it float or not? Whether an object sinks or floats depends on whether its weight is greater or less than its buoyancy. So imagine that you have an object and you've placed it inside a fluid. So the object could be a ship or a submarine in water, but it could also be a hot air balloon in uh, air, for example. There are two forces that are acting on the object. Weight, or the force of gravity, is pulling the object down. And then buoyancy, or the buoyant force, is pushing the object upwards. There are really two possibilities here. Either weight is greater than buoyancy or less than buoyancy. If weight is greater than buoyancy, then the net force on the object will point downwards in the direction of weight. According to Newton's second law of motion, the object would then accelerate downwards, and we describe that situation by saying that the object sinks. On the other hand, if buoyancy is the greater force, then the net force on the object is going to point upwards, and therefore the object will accelerate upwards. It will continue to accelerate upwards until, at some point, weight becomes balanced by buoyancy, and then we say that the object is floating there. That would be the situation if, for example, you pushed a beach ball or maybe an apple underwater 
If you do that, you'll notice that the apple will not stay underwater. It will actually accelerate upwards. It will pop up, essentially. In that case, the buoyant force on the apple is greater, so the apple begins to accelerate upwards, and it will continue to move upwards until at some point weight becomes equal to buoyancy, and then we can say the apple is in equilibrium, and that's where the apple stays, that's where the apple continues to float from that point on. So let's do a practice problem to better understand the interaction between weight and the buoyant force. A beach ball is placed in water. The density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. This is a pretty important number, so you should probably memorize it. The beach ball has a volume of 0.027 cubic meters and a mass of 0.05 kilograms. We are talking about a beach ball, so we're talking about a relatively light object. Find the weight and force of buoyancy in each of the cases below. So we're considering four different scenarios. On the left, scenario one, the beach ball is 100% submerged. In the second scenario, the beach ball is again 100% submerged, but it's just below the water line. In the third scenario, the beach ball is half underwater and half above water. And in the last scenario, I'm not telling you how much of the beach ball is submerged, but I am telling you that the beach ball is in equilibrium, so the net force on it must be zero. Let's start on the left with the first scenario. Calculating the weight is relatively easy. We know mass, and we know that gravitational acceleration is 9.8, so mg will give us the weight of the beach ball. In this case, it turns out to be 0.49 newtons downward. To calculate the buoyant force, we need this form formula. Remember that the buoyant force is equal to the density of the fluid times gravitational acceleration times the volume of fluid that has been displaced. If the beach ball is 100% submerged, then its entire volume, 0.027 cubic meters, is underwater. So we can say that the displaced volume is 0.027. Plugging that number into this equation, we find that the buoyant force in this first scenario is 264.6 newtons. This means that the beach ball is not in equilibrium. The net force is not zero. There is a net force pointing upwards, and therefore this beach ball will accelerate upwards. If you've ever tried to push a beach ball or a basketball, for example, underwater, you know it's quite difficult. As soon as you let it go, it will pop up. That's exactly what's going to happen in this case. The beach ball is going to rapidly accelerate upwards. In the second scenario, weight is once again 0.49 newtons. After all, the mass and the gravitational acceleration have not changed. Buoyancy is again 264.6 newtons. Once again, the beach ball is 100% submerged, so to calculate the buoyant force, the volume that we would plug into this equation would be 0.027. So the force of buoyancy doesn't really care if the beach ball is at a large depth or a small depth. So long as it's 100% submerged, we have the same force of buoyancy. In the third scenario, once again, weight is 0.49 newtons. But the buoyant force is less this time. Only half of the beach ball is underwater, so the fluid volume that has to be displaced or moved out of the way is now only half of the total volume of the beach ball. Substituting half of 0.027 into the buoyant, uh, buoyancy equation, we find that the buoyant uh, force is 132.3 newtons upwards. So once again, the beach ball is not yet in equilibrium. It's going to continue accelerating upwards. In the fourth scenario, weight is again 0.49 newtons. Now we don't know how much of the beach ball is underwater, so we can no longer calculate the buoyant force using this formula on the left. However, we do know that the beach ball has finally reached equilibrium. That means the net force is zero. So if weight is 0.49 down, then the buoyant force must be 0.49 pointing upwards. Let's do another practice problem involving buoyancy. 
A balloon is filled with 8 liters of helium. The balloon's rubber has a mass of 5 grams. Calculate the balloon's acceleration if it is released in air. You may need the following. The mass density of air is given to you and the mass density of helium is also given to you. So we're talking about a relatively light object here, a helium balloon that is floating in air. So the surrounding fluid in this case is air. The volume of the balloon is given to you as 8 liters. The liter is a unit of volume, but it's not the SI unit of volume. The SI unit of volume is cubic meters, so we'll have to do a conversion there. The total mass of the balloon is not given to you. You're told that the balloon's rubber membrane has a mass of 5 grams, but you have to remember that the balloon is filled with helium, and that helium adds to the total mass of the object. Now, normally you would say that helium is pretty light. We can say that its mass is negligible, but in this case, that's not a good idea. As you will soon see, the mass of the helium inside is a significant fraction of the total mass of the balloon. Let's begin by calculating the volume of the balloon. We know the volume is 8 liters. There are 1,000 liters to a cubic meter. That's an important conversion factor, which you should probably memorize. So we find that the volume of the balloon is 8 times 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters. Next, let's calculate the buoyant force. According to the buoyancy formula, the buoyant force is rho gv. In this case, the balloon is floating in air, so the density of the fluid that is placed in this formula should be the density of air. The entire volume of the balloon is submerged, so the volume of the displaced fluid is actually equal to the volume of the balloon in this case. Plugging those numbers in, we find that the buoyant force acting on the balloon is 9.447 times 10 to the minus 2 newtons. Next, we want to calculate the weight of the balloon. That's the force of gravity that is pulling the balloon downwards. However, before calculating the weight, we need the mass of the balloon. Mass of the balloon is equal to the mass of the rubber membrane of the balloon plus the mass of the helium that's inside the balloon. To calculate mass, we remember that density is defined as mass divided by volume. By rearranging this formula, we find that the mass of the helium is simply equal to the density of helium times the volume of helium. The density of helium is given to you, and of course the volume is the volume of the balloon. And so we find that the total mass of the balloon is 6.331 grams. So notice that the balloon consists of 5 grams of rubber and approximately 1.3 grams of helium. Now we can calculate the weight of the balloon. Weight, of course, is simply mass times gravitational acceleration. And we find that the weight of the balloon is 6.205 times 10 to the minus 2 newtons. Now notice there are two forces acting on the balloon. Weight is pulling the balloon downwards, like so. And of course, buoyancy is pushing the balloon upwards, like so. In order to calculate the acceleration of the balloon, we need the net force on the balloon. The net force of the balloon is found by adding these two forces. But of course, one of them is negative, so we can find the, the net force by uh, subtracting weight from buoyancy. Once we have the net force, we can calculate the acceleration using Newton's second law of motion. According to the second law of motion, acceleration is equal to the net force divided by mass. Net force is B minus W. So we find that the net force on the balloon is 3.243 times 10 to the minus 2 Newtons in the positive y direction. We calculated the mass. Taking the ratio, we find that the acceleration of this balloon when released is going to be 5.122 meters per second squared upwards. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.